Hi there, I'm Phil Folio, and today on Two Geeks Talking, we'll be talking about me and uh, the work I do with my wife, Kaya, on Girl Genius, on Magic the Gathering, and any number of uh, interesting and philosophical concepts that will make you a better person. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very special guest. He has been on the show way back when, when we were still doing an audio podcast. He was one of the very first people that I've wanted to interview for a very long time as well, too. Uh, and I'm glad to have him back on the show. You know his work from Girl Genius Online, as well as the fact of Magic the Gathering and a bunch of other things that he is so talented in, as well as his his wife, Kaja, as well, too. We are joined today by the ever-talented Phil Folio. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about yourself, Kurt? Doing wonderful. You know, uh, as I was saying, it's, it's been about 13 years since you've been on the show. You were one of the very first guest that I ever had of, of any professional status on TG, on TGT web comics. I, I want to thank you so much for, for doing that way back when, and thank you so much for coming back on the show. Oh, no problem. I, you know, I'm glad I'm responsible for the mansion and the yacht and the whole <laughs> thing like that, you know? <laughs> well, I got a Toyota more than anything, but you know, it works out for me. Good, yes, yeah. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, and shame on them if they don't know anything about you, tell us Very who true. you are and what you're all about. I'm a cartoonist, which means that uh, I'm a writer, I'm an artist, you know, I'm a small business person. Currently, I'm working with my wife, Kaya, and we produce Girl Genius, but... You know, I also write novels and illustrate books and games and stuff like that. So you've kept busy in all these years. <laughs> yes. Girl Genius Online was one of the very first comics I, I ever got to to read when I first forayed into, into web comics. And the story's been ongoing for a number of, of years now here. When you first started this, did you ever think so many decades later that you'd still keep it going for as long as you both have? No. Um, I mean, it's close to 22 years now, so we never thought it would be, you know, going that long. It was, uh, you know, I don't think anybody says, well, you know, hey, dear, what do you want to do for the next 25 years or so? <laughs> I don't know. We could do a comic. Yeah, I guess yeah, I would do that. No, you know, even uh, Richard and Wendy Peeney didn't think that. Um Stan Sakai might have. He he's he's a deep one. We were just determined to tell this particular story and just decided to keep going with it as long as it was fun. So then, how did Magic the Gathering come about? Because I, I started playing that about five or six years ago, but it's an incredible game. It is an incredible game. Wizards of the Coast started. There was a guy named Richard Garfield. Boom, came up with an idea. Who's a mathematician? came up with an idea for a game, brought it to a guy he knew named uh, Peter Atkinson. And Peter was like, this is really good. We should put this together and make a game and make a company. And at that time, they formed a company which pretty much consisted of six guys in Peter's basement. They were doing a lot of prep work and they were securing funding. Richard was like, so what do I do? And they were like, um, well, your part and this is pretty much done, right? <laughs> so, you know, uh, he was like, well, I, I want to do something. And they were like, fine, go write us another game. <clears throat> he came up with a game called Robo Rally. It was a nice, it, nice. It was a very complicated and again brilliant board game they decided to print that while they were waiting for things to come together for magic uh i had just moved to seattle at the time so they called me up and they were like hey would you like to illustrate this uh this game and i was like oh that sounds cool sure absolutely you know you know here's my rates and they were like ah we can't really pay that. And I was like, I'm not being unreasonable. And they're like, no, you're not being unreasonable, but tell you what, 
will pay you half in cash and half in shares of the company. And I was like, well, originally they wanted to pay me all in shares of the company, but I was like, oh, um, no, I want at least half cash for that. So that kissed away like a couple hundred thousand dollars, but I took it, I did it. So I was kind of on their books when they were getting ready to release the game. Uh, some friends of ours who knew them a little better than I did invited us to go to a party in Peter's basement. <laughs> I was with Kaya at the time, or still am, but that was the beginning of the time. And um, we uh, we were invited and we went and uh, we sat around and we played this new game. And I was like, holy cow, this is going to be like terrific. They asked us if we wanted to do more work for it. I was like, wow, yeah. And they were like, we're still paying in shares of the company. And I was like, you know what? I'll take that bet, sure. <laughs> so what was the first creature you created for Magic the Gathering? First creature? Or card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I got like 13 cards hmm. for the first one. That was for the legendary set. I think that was one of the ones in there was Infernal Darkness, which was basically, you know, they were like, well, it goes, it's a card where, you know, things, you know, go towards the the black. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure, I can do that. And basically I showed, you know, a landscape and an enormous demon snuffing out the sun, which I think was a little bit more than they expected. But, you know, people seem to like it. Looking at your, your journey as, as an artist and, and a creative person, what was the first piece of work that you created that you thought, yes, I could do this professionally? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's actually rather easy. I was in New York City. I'd started doing some work for TSR. I'd uh, gone to, man, was it the first Gen Con? It was the first or second Gen Con. It was basically in a church basement in uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. I showed my art portfolio to... Uh, the editor of Dragon Magazine, and he started uh, giving me a couple of covers, which uh, was nice. They uh, seemed to enjoy those. When I was in New York, I uh, was on the subway, and I was like looking up at a subway ad for I don't even remember what. You know, I had the idea, oh, hey, I could do a cartoon where I basically redesigned chess so that it was like a role-playing game. And I thought that was immensely clever back in 1980. You know, I could send that to TSR and they'd buy that. And I thought about it and I was like, at the time I was, and still am, an incredibly lazy person. And I was like, I could lay that out and I could draw that up and I could send that in. They would buy it. And that would net me like 25 bucks. And I was like, I could give blood and make more than that. But if I, uh, excuse me. Hey, Hi. Oh, yes. What are you doing? I'm uh, doing an interview. You wish to join me? What? I, 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 you never tell me anything. I didn't tell you. <laughs> Yes, yes. So I was like, okay, you know, but if I come up with like five more jokes, I could do an entire page. And that's like $300, which back in the 1980s was not hay. So I was like, okay. So I did that up and I sent that in. And I was like, well, there you go. And uh, I got a phone call back from TSR. And they were like, you know, this is really funny. Uh, we'll take as many of these as you can do. And I was like, that pays my rent. <laughs> uh, that was What's New. And uh, that ran in Dragon Magazine. Whew, well, let's see, the first time, three years. And then I was pretty much tapped out doing uh, gamer jokes for a while. Mm -hmm. 
especially since I never played. And then uh, 14 years later, they uh, they asked me to revive the strip for uh, The Duelist, which was about Magic the Gathering. And I was like, yeah, okay, I can do that, sure. And as soon as uh, uh, The Duelist went under, because it was absorbed by uh, Pokemon, mm. the phone call, they called me up and they were like, you know, oh, hey, you know, uh, we're shutting down the Duelist magazine. Uh, sorry to hear about that, but, you know, that's the way it goes. I was like, well, it was a good gig. Thank you very much. And I put down the phone and it rang again. Mm. Like, yes, hello? They were like, hi, I'm, uh, this is Dave Gross. I'm uh, pretty much at the next desk so desk over here at uh, Wizards of the Coast, who just bought TSR, and uh, we're bringing uh, Dragon Magazine back, and since you're no longer working for Duelist, would you like to <laughs> revive the strip for Dragon Magazine? And I was like, man, I, I can't I can't stop working even if I want to. <laughs> to uh, put out what's new until the magazine again folded. <laughs> so, which was not my fault. <laughs> It's just amazing your your creative journey that you've experienced from when you first started to currently now here as well. The age of of analog to digital, I'm sure, was a, a huge transition from an it artistic was absolutely perspective. How how have you navigated that, and has it improved your your process? Well, the the transition to digital was actually probably the biggest thing. Uh, we started Girl Genius as just a regular comic book. Mm -hmm. came out like quarterly. We were putting it together. At the time, a lot of people were saying, how do I break into comics? And I was like, well, man, if I had my choice to do it over, I'll tell you what I'd do. I'd do one of these webcomic things. Those are just, you know... It's so much easier and it's so much cheaper and you don't have to deal with uh, what we call gatekeepers. I mean, you know, after a while, we started realizing, you know, instead of giving this advice, we should be taking this advice. We were up to, gosh, was it issue 13 of the comic? And the comic was doing really good for a independent comic. And then we noticed something really kind of weird. We were continually getting orders from Diamond and the, <laughs> like, 30 other distributors <laughs> that were around at the time. And we noticed something really interesting. A new issue of Girl Genius would come out. And there would be this big peak in orders. But it wouldn't just be for the new book. It would be for everything else. It's like people would walk into the shop and they'd see the new issue of Girl Genius and they would go, Girl Genius, this sounds interesting. Are there any others? Well, yes, there's old, there's older issues. Great. And so it's like the new book boosted the signal of all the others. And so there would be this big upsurge in sales, which would kind of decay until the next one came out. <laughs> and we realized that we were not really putting out a book. We were putting out an ad for Girl Genius that people saw in the shops. And we were putting one out like every three, four months. So we decided to do the, to make the jump from comics to digital. We did that pretty much all at once. It was just like there was a perfect storm of stuff that in essence went wrong. And we were like, wow, you know, I don't know if we can, you know, afford to uh, print this book, but posting a book online it's free. <laughs> um, so we put that out. All of a sudden, things started going great. Uh, we realized that instead of an ad that came out like every four months, we were putting an ad that came out three times a week. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people in the industry were like, you know, what are you doing? This is crazy. You've got a book. Up until that time, if you started out in web comics, you would collect enough stuff 
and then you would put out a book and that would be how you monetized, you know, your stuff. You know, it takes about a year uh, to put out enough stuff that you can fill said book. Well, we were kind of ahead of the curve there because we'd been doing this analog for like, was it two, three years at this point? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, about that. When people started looking for Girl Genius, they could go down to the comic book store and holy cow, there was like stuff already there waiting for them. So a lot of the comic book stores and a lot of the distributors were like, what the hell are you doing? You're, you're taking this thing that you were charging money for that we were getting money for and you are giving it away for free. You are an insane person. We were like, I'm not going to argue with you, but, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. And within a year, our readership had gone through the roof and our sales of physical books had tripled. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. What's the most misunderstood aspect about telling someone that you're a cartoonist and an illustrator that maybe people in the industry don't understand? Um, there are a lot of people who you tell them that you, you do cartoonists. And even now there's a lot of people who are like, so like those things in, uh, in comic books and uh, newspapers and stuff like that, you know, those drawings, somebody does that that's done by a person. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. It is done by a person. I am in fact that person. Because my dad was kind of like that. He died a while ago, but he lived long enough that uh, he could see that I was, in fact, going to be a success. But according to my mother, he just could not believe that I was going to be su success drawing those stupid little cartoons. <laughs> and on the other hand, he was like super proud because he was convinced that I'd figured out some weird scam um, that, you know, people were paying me money, obviously not for the drawings, but, you know, for, for something. And, you know, he was like, I don't know how he's doing it, but that's, that's, oh, it's really good. You know, my dad was not the best role model in many ways, but, you know. It's great having someone believe in, in your Oh, yeah, your absolutely. Creativity, for sure. You know, is there a comic that made you feel the way you hoped readers of your work will feel after reading your work? Hmm. Uh, wow. It depends what you want to get out of it. There's, there's a lot of comics that are... Uh, really good or that were really good and of course you know you're going to ask me for examples and they all immediately fly out of my head elf quest is a good one i mean when elf quest you know during that first run oh my gosh when when new issues came out at uh, conventions and stuff a new issue hit everything stopped people just sat around and read it and then like, you know, a half an hour, everything went back to, you know, whatever it is everybody was doing. But they were just so caught up in uh, in the story and everything. It was just a thing that they loved so much. And I was like, you know, that's that's really well done. Yeah, I want to I want to be able to do that. Uh, that was an amazing, amazing comic for sure. Oh, yes. Series for that matter. Um, the industry has changed so much and it continues to change and evolve from comics to entertainment to the consumption of media as fast as everyone is doing it, uh, especially with 7 billion plus people. What is it for the young, younger generation that they need to understand if they want to become not only a business person, but a creative person? All right. A um, couple of things. The best advice I can give, if you want to be a creative person, do not try to do the next Marvel 
superhero. Marvel's got plenty of superheroes. They've got plenty of people who do them. I'm not saying you can't be a groundbreaker doing that, but it'll be a while before you stand out. What you want to do is you want to do something that Marvel or DC cannot or will not. You know, somebody's got to do first and then... Sure, in like five years, it may be, oh, everybody's doing that. But, you know, you know, it's good if you are the first person to do it. Because of web comics, you no, long, no longer have to convince an editor. You can just put it online. Do it. Another thing to remember is that this is, in fact, you know, your job is cartoonist. Do not be afraid to ask for money. Do not be afraid to insist that you get paid. You know, you have to be open to new ideas like, you know, when we switch to uh, to digital, you know, you have to be uh, willing to embrace that. You know, uh, there are a lot of uh, comic book companies that they would call us up and they would go, wow, how do you work in this, uh, this webcomic thing? And it was like, well, you put it up on free and for free and they, uh, you know, they read it and they like it so much that they buy it. And they were like, no, wait a minute. You're you're telling me the thing that uh, people have been paying good money for for like 20 years. You just give it to them for free. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And they were like, that ain't going to last. <laughs> and I was like, there you go. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Language had power. Uh, where do you come up with these questions? Um, years of experience. <laughs> um, this is one of the things I tell people. People are like, wow, how do you write characters that are like so much smarter than, uh, than you obviously are? And I'm like, well, thank you very much. And the secret is, you know, I'm sitting here going, I don't know. Whereas in the book, you know, a character will be asked a question like that and they'll go, ah, boom. And they'll come up with this beautiful erudite, you know, insightful quote in the next panel. In real life, everybody gets there eventually. And in, uh, in fiction, the smart people get there instantly. Wow, I'm going to have to think about that. What's the next question? Sure. Three things you're looking forward to accomplishing and yeah. three things you're looking forward to accomplishing in the future. My wife and I managed to uh, raise our kids to uh, college age, doing nothing but, you know, comics and illustration and freelance work. So, you know, never had to get a real job. I'm pretty pleased about that. We have produced something that a lot of people really like. Um, you know, we constantly get, you know, people coming up to us at conventions or writing to us online. And they're like, oh, my gosh, I really liked uh, your strip. And, you know, I've been reading it for 20 years. And it means a lot to me. And is that, yeah, I'm really proud, proud about that. Wow. Uh, three things. Um, However many you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got uh, acknowledgement, you know, we've got the acknowledgement of our peers. I mean, we've won a bunch of Hugo Awards and we've been nominated for a bunch of comic awards. You know, it's not like we're toiling away in obscurity here. So I'm pretty pleased about that. So three things I would like to do. I would like if we manage to create a uh, story that had legs, that survived. If like 100 years from now, uh, people were still reading girl genius maybe not the original story but the uh you know uh the cast and the characters and the uh the settings 
you know, they were all familiar to people and and people were, you know, willing to absorb them into the uh, into the zeitgeist. I'd feel pretty happy about that. My wife and I both want to be able to uh, get our company to the point where our kids will be able to take it over. And they're both really good artists and writers in their own right. We want to be able to provide a structure so that they can continue to uh, work, not even necessarily on Girl Genius, but we have a structure set up so that they can do their own thing, but, you know, maybe not have to uh, break into it from scratch like uh, like we did. And I would like to find a suitcase by the side of the road with $5 million in it. That's, you know, that's pretty much my big ambition, you know. Ten with inflation. Um, <laughs> I'm not greedy. No, <laughs> simple. Yeah, I like it. Every Every creative person has a... A situation or a process that maybe they struggle with. What is one of yours? Entropy, I guess. Um, I mean, you know, we're pretty good at coming up with stories and we're pretty good at sitting down and getting them done. I mean, we've been doing Girl Genius as a webcomic for like over 15 years and we have you know, I think missed one update in all that time. And that was because we were in Australia and we got fucked up with the international dateline. And we were pretty annoyed about it, let me tell you. But you would think, you know, hey, you should be able to just like put this out and, you know, why are you not like, you know, it only comes out three times a week. Why are you not like two years ahead or something? Like uh, David Willis, who does uh, the comic Dumbing of Age, you know, he periodically posts an update. He's like, okay, I'm working on like October of 2026. Yo! And I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> um, and I just can't do that. Something happens. You know, I go on a trip or uh, I throw my, my arm out or something. And, and it's like I said, it's just entropy. I'm not allowed, you know, by cosmic fate to, uh, to get like too far ahead. The, the best I ever did was, uh, we did a trip to Australia and I managed to get like a month ahead or something. And it was like, you know, it was really nice, but <laughs> just couldn't, you know, couldn't st sustain it. Yeah, that's that's the trouble with trying to have a queue of some kind. It's like yeah. it, it disappears so quickly. <laughs> it does. Do you have any Kickstarter campaigns yourselves coming up for any projects? We are in the process of fulfilling our last one. That was for Girl Genius Volume 20, uh, The Exorcism Engines. That ran earlier in the year, and it did very well. It's at the printer's. We should have that back sometime uh, by the end of this year, and then we'll get it printed, uh, packed up, and shipped out. Uh, printing is is in a mess right now. We decided, you know, we're going to get all of our stuff done in the USA, so we don't have to deal with supply chains or uh, weird governments or anything like that. Ignoring <laughs> the fact that we've got one right here. Thank you very much. Uh, but. Uh, the problem is, is that printers rely on supply chains. I mean, you know, we're constantly getting updates from them about, you know, paper and this, that, and the other thing. That said, uh, they've been around for, I think it's like 60 years or something. And so um, we're, uh, we're pretty confident. And I know the quality of their work is really good, so... Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Oh, that's easy. My wife, Kaya. Hmm. I've been in the uh, industry, you know, in one form or another for uh, 40 some odd years. Uh, this thing I'm doing with her, Girl Genius, that's certainly the best thing I've ever done. And it's been seen by the most people. I put that down purely to, uh, 
you know, the fact that it's a collaboration with her. How did you two meet? Oh, (laughs) well, let's see. I moved to Seattle. There was a comic shop owner that I knew. You know, Kaya went to this comic book shop and already, you know, collected my stuff. The owner happened to mention to her, you know, he's moved to town. And she was like, really? I said, yeah. So uh, the shop owner arranged for it so that we all went out to dinner together. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were, we were kind of set up in a very proper Victorian manner. You know, it took a while, but, uh, you know, it, uh, it obviously worked out. Career and relationship, and it's something everyone should aspire towards. <laughs> True. From a professional standpoint, you have been in the creative industry for over 40 years. Plus, you've done Girl Genius for 22 years, and you're doing such an, you both are doing such amazing work with it as well, too. So, professionally, you are successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Hmm. Yes, but. Um, you know, I could be more so, Hmm. um, I don't have the inclination to do this. Thank goodness. But I couldn't afford to retire, Hmm. you know, (laughs) um, you know, I'll, I'll just keep drawing and writing, um, mostly because I like it. Thank goodness. But, uh, also let's be honest because, like I said, uh, couldn't really afford to not do it. So in that regard, you know, I could be doing better. But uh, successful? Yes, yes, I think so. We produce a thing that people like, you know, there's a reasonable chance that you go to any uh, part on the globe and a portion of people you know, we'll uh, we'll actually know who we are and what kind of stuff we do through one project or another. Probably more magic than Girl Genius, but you know, hey, I'll take it. There is we've gotten any number of uh, Girl Genius readers who are like, you know, Phil and Kaya Folio. I no, they're they're magic artists, and people are like, yes, they are, but they also do this, and they're like. Oh, oh, I'll pick this up. Has it got cards in it? And I'm like, you know, whatever. You know, I'll take it. You know, <laughs> the reverse of success is failure. Failure. How do you deal with your failures? Uh, you gotta let it go. You gotta say, "Wow, okay, that was a stupid decision. What did I do?" What was the mistake I made? Okay, I figured out what it was. Don't do that again. That's pretty much all you can do, really. There are people who, you know, you can hire to help you not make mistakes, like lawyers to look at contracts, you know. Hire them. Let them do their job. Listen to what they say. You know, don't take on a job or uh, don't, you know, commit to something that, you know, would ruin your life if if it all went south. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as an artist or a writer or something creative that maybe they like to do. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? First of all, be seen, you know, nobody is going to be inspired by somebody who makes like the most amazing web comic and posts it in their basement. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you've got to be tech savvy and people savvy enough that, you know, your thing will get seen by other people. Produce stuff that you believe in, an axiom that, uh, we've been following for a long, long time is make the kind of stuff that you want to read. If nobody's out there doing the kind of stuff you want, well, there you go. There's an automatic market 
out there because you are not a unique snowflake. There's there's probably a bunch of other people who would also like to see this kind of stuff. So do that. Gosh, what else? Be good and be nice in your dealings with other people, not just within your industry. Boy, that's an important one. This is like 10 times more important than it was even 20 years ago, because you just never know. You're walking down the street and you just like feel miserable and you kick a dog or something. And oh my gosh, you'll be on, you know, YouTube within within 15 seconds. You know, and there you go. That'll destroy your entire career because it'll be selectively edited and they will like leave out the dog foaming and coming at you. Ah, and it'll just be like Phil Folio kicks dogs. Ah, you know. So, so you just gotta, you just gotta watch yourself. It's kind of, it's kind of nerve wracking. For the record, I have never kicked a dog. Thank you very much. Just wanted to get that out there. I I won't selectively edit that. So, um, (laughs) I will kill you. (laughs) Oh, wait, now you'll use that. (laughs) If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Well, the soundtrack, you know, I'll go with, you know, the James Gunn method. I'd say just a medley of musical hits from the 50s up through the 90s, because, you know, there you go. Title? Title. I don't know. Not dead yet. Well, that's that's very apropos, and, and I hope you live for another hundred years then. Uh, <laughs> creating or talent. die trying. <laughs> Oh, gosh, that's great. (laughs) Well, Phil, I I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Sure. Hey, man, 14 years from now, we got to do this again. I'd be more than happy to. Uh, Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you both, uh, of course, online and on the the internets? Ah. Well, the uh, the comic goes up... uh, Girl Genius, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at girlgeniusonline.com. You can buy our books online from us. You can buy them at any good comic book store. And if they don't have our stuff, they're not a good comic book store. Uh, But even the mediocre comic book stores will cheerfully order it if you uh, threaten them. You know, if you're stuck in a total wasteland, you can, in fact, order stuff from, uh, you know, Barnes and Noble and Amazon and stuff like that. Let's see. We also have uh, novels that uh, we've worked on, you know, where we've novelized the Girl Genius series. Uh, we're currently working on the fifth book of that. I have a couple of non Girl Genius novels out there. The newest one is The Night Sheriff. That just came out last year, I think. And uh, of course, we have a Patreon. So, you know, you can basically just give us money for just sheer existing, which, you know, I'd like to encourage everybody to do. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And we do have a page shrine as well. So I, I'd like to you know, copy his sentiment of giving money, which is patreon.com forward slash tgt media and as i say every week everyone has a story to tell it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on two geeks talking